Praise God. If you have your Bibles, uh, Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. And the series that we're going to be discussing and spending time on this month is called Building Together. Now, God, as, as you read God's character, he's about building. God is about developing and building and growing. And all throughout the word of God, we find that in scripture. God is about building. And God has called you and I to be participants, uh, to participate in building his kingdom. Each and every one of us have a part to play in that task uh, this, this evening. And we all have a part to play. And we're going we're gonna to learn that this month, building together. In uh, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3. We're going to get ready to read that. And as, I, as, as we prepare to do that, I was, I was thinking about, I was going back and thinking about how the Lord called me and how things transpired in my life. You know, God's an orchestrator. Man, I look back and I see the people that God placed in my life, uh, my leaders, those that prayed for me, those that instructed me, um, situations and circumstances. And how many know that we're in, when, when we're in the middle of these circumstances and these situations, sometimes it doesn't make sense. Sometimes we don't see the hand of God on it. But as you and I are faithful and as we trust God and we pursue God and we continue to be faithful to what God's called us to, as we, as we journey on, we're able to look back and we're able to get, get a glimpse at the glory of God and how he worked so miraculously in our lives. I think of the circumstances. I think of, of everything that he orchestrated. And that's why I'm here today, because of God's grace. And as powerful as that is, as powerful as the circumstances were that God used to move me into position, uh, to accept him and to know him, and as great as that is, you know where it started for me? It started with the prayer. It started with me opening up my heart and saying yes to Jesus. It started with the prayer. God was powerful and, and awesome and amazing and everything that he did. But had I not decided to pray and to ask him to come into my life so that I would know him, I would have only gone so far. It started with the prayer. And let's read tonight Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3 through 6. Just setting up the, the scene here. Nehemiah was a servant in service to Artaxerxes. And this time of, of scripture that was taking place, the, the children of God, the Jews, were, were returning from exile in Babylon back into Judah, and yes, even into Jerusalem. And Nehemiah's brother, uh, Nehemiah asked his brother, how are things there in Judah? How are they in Jerusalem? And his brother said, they're not good. And this is where we, we kick off here, Nehemiah 1, 3 through 6, verse 3. They said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted and prayed to the God of heaven. Then I said, O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. In verse 6, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me pray night and day for your people, Israel. I confess we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. Let's bow our heads tonight as we pray. Father, we just thank you, God, for this blessed opportunity, Lord, to be here in your presence, God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would minister to our hearts. Give us understanding of your word, Lord. I pray that you would help us to understand the value of, the importance, God, of prayer in our life, O oh Lord, that you would just help us, Father. We thank you. We give you praise, honor, and glory. We ask in Jesus' name. We all say, amen. Tonight, I want to speak a message entitled, Pray First. Pray First. Now, as we look in our text there, Nehemiah 1, verse 3, the first thing we have to understand regarding the importance of prayer is that we have to learn as children of God to respond with prayer. Each and every day, we go through things, right? We go through situations, tests, and trials that present themselves to us. And as God's people, we have to respond to these things and these circumstances with prayer. 
running to Jesus, running to God, because he is the only one that can help us. Can you say amen? He's the one that knows our needs. He's the one that can provide for every need that we have. He created you and I. He understands you. You ever feel sometimes like, yeah, they don't understand me. They don't understand me. God understands you. The Lord understands you. He created you. We have to respond with prayer. So here was Nehemiah, and he gets this, the news from his brother that things are not going well for God's people there in Judah. And what did he do? What did he do? Did he pick up his phone? Did he, did he post something on Facebook to get uh, everyone's opinion and then put a poll out there and to, to find out what he or she uh, thinks should happen? What did he do? Did he call up so-and-so or so-and-so? Or, or did he, did he uh, seek the, the counsel of the people that are around him? What did he do? In verse 4, we see what he did. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. See, there are three types of responses that we could have when situations present themselves and when we're going through trials and testing. One is we can seek the counsel and the help of others first. I'm talking about first response, okay? We could seek the opinion and the thoughts of other people. We could look within ourselves. We could try to figure it out ourselves and according to our own opinion and our own, our own uh, wisdom and our own mindset. But I believe as we look at the third category is that we have to run to God first and foremost. Very first thing is we have to run to God. Because we can mess things up. Can you say amen? And each and every one of us, where things take months and years, God's piecing things together, God's working. He's moving, he's rebuilding. He's, he's, perhaps he's rebuilding your life tonight. You're in a process, right? And sometimes the process of construction, it doesn't look attractive, does it? How many see those buildings there in downtown or, or, or perhaps road work that's being done? There's cones that are set up. There's dirt everywhere. It's a process. The process of construction sometimes doesn't look appealing and it doesn't feel good. But we're under construction. And you know what's beautiful is God sees the masterpiece that he's creating in you. We may not see it, others may not see it, but God is working in, in your life and he's, he, he's, he's molding you. The Bible said he, that he's the potter, that we're, that we're only the clay and he's, he, he's working, he, he's, he's tending to your needs and, and he's helping mold and shape us. There's some lumps inside of us that God wants to pull out and God wants to form. You're a masterpiece in the making. Don't throw in the towel, don't give it up. Don't run away from the process. We have to seek God. Matthew 6, the Bible says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Seek God's will for your life. Don't live according to your own will and, and, and our own opinions and ideas and, and, and the, the things that we think are important. Live according to God's word. Seek him first, and he'll give you everything that you need. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful promise. He'll give you everything you need. Psalm chapter 63, verse 1. This is a Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. He said, Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. Early will I seek you. How many of us sometimes when a situation happens, God's the last one that we seek, or he's the fifth one on the list? We call up so-and-so or we text so-and-so. What do you think about this? I heard this. Did you see this? What's going on with this? And we're so quick. And, and, and I understand we don't serve God in a vacuum. We need each other. God's placed godly pastors and leaders over our life for us to seek counsel. But the Lord, first and foremost, should be the one that we seek first. That should be the first response. Our first response. And then God will lead you. God will direct you through his word, through wise counsel. But run to the Lord first and foremost. Early will I seek you. In your situation, are you seeking him early? I mean, this, this also talks about the time of day that we should seek him first in the day, right? But also in your situation, seek him early. I was reading an article 
written by uh, someone here in the army, and, and they were talking about the importance of muscle memory. And this was a pilot of an Apache, and he was talking about the importance of practice and repetition uh, to create muscle memory. And, and I want to read that. He says, if it says, if practice makes perfect, these crew members want to be well-practiced. It's the repetition that creates the muscle memory, which soldiers need when they encounter potential danger. The more repetition we get with battle drills, this person said, that's what they're created for. You get that muscle memory where it comes down to where you have to use that skill. It's automatic. Said Marcus Nakamura, an Apache pilot, a lot of the skills we know and use, if we don't put them into action, we'll end up losing them. We'll lose the muscle memory. And it goes on to say, eventually, muscle memory becomes a natural response. It becomes instinctual. You don't have to think about it. You just do it. It becomes a faster process. And how important that is in battle, right? If, if, if these soldiers were just relying on their thoughts and what's going on, that's one thing. But they have to have muscle memory so that they respond in an instant and it will save, it will save their life. And that's how it is in the kingdom of God. God wants us to respond with prayer. He wants us to have that spiritual muscle memory so when things transpire that we're, that we're ready and we're trained to run to him, to talk to him, to ask him what he thinks about this. And can I say, that may be as far as that problem gets. If you and I would run to Jesus first, if we would take it to prayer, God can work right then and there. We might save ourselves a lot of trouble and heartache. Respond with prayer. In understanding how to pray first, we have to understand that prayer also brings revelation. God gives vision to us. He's able to download things in our hearts. As we make prayer a part of our life, he's able to speak to us. He's able to lead you in those situations. And, and I'm not talking about just here in the four walls. God wants to be Lord and Savior of every area of our life. Every time frame. There it's your job. You need God's wisdom. God wants to download strategy for you at your job to be successful there. To be that successful leader that God's called you to be. Yes, even in ministry, God wants to download that, that information, that revelation, so that you could be a blessing to that ministry. It comes through prayer. And boy, we get so busy. And you don't have to tell me, with, 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 with work, with family, with children, with marriage, with ministry, all these things, right? We can, our, our schedule can be so packed and so full that it gets, it gets so noisy. And sometimes we have to just pull away and we have to always have prayer as a priority in our life. There's a powerful passage in Acts chapter 10. And as you get a chance, I, I, I encourage you to read this entire chapter. But this is the passage where, where Peter went to minister to the Gentiles. See, when Jesus came, he, he was mainly ministering to the Jews, right? He was, he was reaching those that he called his disciples. They were Jews. So he was ministering to the Jews. He also talked to some non-Jews. But that was the main thing that he was going after. And, but, but after he died, his will was that the Gentiles, that's you and I, the non-Jewish people, would be saved as well. And we see a beautiful passage here how that plan unfolded. And God brought revelation to Simon Peter. And here in Acts chapter 10, verse 9, this is regarding uh, Cornelius as well. And in verse 9 it says, The next day as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon. And you'll read in that passage that the Lord gave him a dream, how a large sheet came down uh, from heaven, and there were many animals, and the Lord told him to kill and eat. And Peter, in this, in this vision, told the Lord, I've, I've never killed anything unclean. But the Lord told him, what I have called clean, don't call unclean. And this was a revelation for him to go minister to the Gentiles. And, and here salvation came to the Gentiles. But where did it start? Chapter 10, verse 9, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. What if he was too busy to pray? Would that revelation have come? Cornelius and his entire household were minister, they were ministered the gospel. They were saved. But where did it start? It started in prayer. We can never lose the importance of prayer. If we're going to talk about building, building together, that's why we kick this series off with this message. It's prayer. 
It's prayer. We have to stay in prayer. An attitude of prayer, we have to pray. God has a plan for your life for this month, for June. Sometimes we talk in terms of our entire life, and that's, that's true, but God has something that he wants to do in your life and use you in a certain way this month in June. What is that? You'll find it in prayer. How about for this year, 2021, you'll find it in prayer. God will give you revelation for your children, for your household, for your ministry, for your job, for your friendships, for those around you, husbands, for your, for your marriage, wives, for your marriage as well. God will give you revelation, but it's found in prayer. As we look in our text in Nehemiah chapter 1, we look there in verse 1. It says, in late autumn, and this is where Nehemiah got the news. It was this season of his life in, in autumn. And then we look at the timeline, and as, it, as time transpired, Nehemiah was in front of the king, and the king asked him a, a powerful question. Because Nehemiah's countenance was downtrodden, and he was downcast, and he was discouraged. And in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4, it says, The king asked him, Well, how can I help you? See, the king, with all of his resources, how Nehemiah was serving him in, in, in humility and being a good servant, the king asked him, How can I help you? And when this question transpired, is, this was in the season of spring. So we go from autumn to spring. Sometimes in the Word of God, we, we read these chapters and, and we could think that it's just the next day or the next month, but it's a season. And can I say that some of you are in a season in this place and God's doing something awesome. You may not see it. You may not understand it, but God is working something out in your life. Don't despise the season that you're in because there's an answer that's coming for you. And here with Nehemiah in chapter 2, verse 4, the king asks, how can I help you? See, there are things that you're praying about. God desires to supply for the need that you have. And God will send people to you that ask you that question, how can I help you? They have the resources. Perhaps it's a financial need. God will send someone to ask you that question, how can I help you? I've seen it in my life where, where I've prayed. I've prayed about situations and there's been, there have been financial needs that we've had and I've taken it to prayer and, and within moments you get a text, right? Who've got that text? Or the check in the mail that we've heard about. God meets the need, but it starts in prayer. We have to be in prayer, church. God wants to meet your need. He wants to bring revelation, but it's found in prayer. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, Jesus says, I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. That's good news tonight, church. If you're looking for a promise, there it is, right there from Jesus. I tell you, you pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be your, yours. Pray. Take it to prayer. Pray about it. God knows. God has the answer. When it comes to taking it to God and, and, and talking about prayer, we have to understand that we have to keep a right heart. We have to have a right heart. We have to keep a right heart in the eyes of God. We've got to do our best, and we'll, we'll never be perfect, but we can strive for having a perfect and an upright heart. So as we're talking about having a perfect and an upright heart, we have to look at things that can hinder our prayers. One of them is unforgiveness. Mark eleven twenty five. 25, but when you were praying, first forgive anyone you were holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. You want God to hear you? You want God to forgive you? Forgive your brother. Forgive your sister. Give it to him. Let forgiveness be a practice in, in our lives, something that we, we practice. A spiritual response to being to being offended, let it be forgiveness. Don't let it be malice. Don't let it be hate. Don't let it be revenge, but let it be forgiveness. Let that practice take place in our life. Forgiveness. What else hinders our prayers? Bitterness. The Bible says that bitterness will, will defile us. And how does bitterness grow? How does bitterness foster in our lives? Well, if there's, if, there's unseated, if there's unforgiveness in our lives and we're not dealing with it, 
it's going to turn into bitterness. What does bitterness do, man? It steals the joy from your day. It steals the joy. It holds you back. If we're bitter, we're not able to enjoy all the blessings that God's given us because there's unforgiveness in our hearts. How about self-righteousness? There's a passage you could write down here and read for later. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 through 14. This was about the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the Pharisee went before God and said, God, I thank you that I'm not like so-and-so and so-and-so. I'm not like this person. Thank you I'm not like them. But the tax collector was beating his chest and saying, God, forgive me. He couldn't even look up to heaven because he was so convicted and condemned for his sin. And Jesus said, who do you think walked away justified in that scenario? It wasn't the Pharisee. It was the one that had humility that wasn't self-righteous. So self-righteousness can defile our hearts. Unbelief. Hebrews 319, so we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. Believe in God's word. Believe in his truth. Malice is something else that could hinder our prayers. In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 7 through 18, the Bible says, don't rejoice when your enemies fall. Don't be happy when they stumble. For the Lord will be displeased with you. And will turn his anger away from them. How many of us, many times, are the, I told you so. I told you. I told you. It's like when my kids are fighting sometimes. And when, when my son wants to get the best of, of the other kids, he'll point at them. Ha, 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 ha. Isn't that what we do? When someone that we know is in the wrong, when they fall on their face, do we take pleasure in that? Because that doesn't please the Lord. We're talking about character, the love of God. Don't rejoice when your enemies fall. Don't be happy when they stumble. James 5.16, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Prayer will give us hope. And assurance, Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised who promise is faithful. You thank God tonight for his faithfulness, church? I thank God for his faithfulness. Hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Church, God is faithful. God is faithful to you. He's faithful to what he promised you. Don't let the enemy uh, lie to, to you. Don't let the enemy plant those seeds in your heart. And church, if there's ever a time that we need to hear this, it's today, it's now. We don't have to look far to, to get bad news. You turn on the news, you turn on the TV. What's the majority of the content on the news today? It's tragedy, it's, it's destruction, it's death, it's bad news. And I... I just want to take a moment to encourage, encourage anyone in this place tonight. And I know we're, there's a good crowd here tonight, but sometimes the enemy could try to isolate us and, and convince you that you're alone. You're not alone tonight. You're not alone. And yes, even the believer, even the Christian can feel that way sometimes. And if I could speak through God's word, words of hope tonight is that, it may seem bad, but it's not that bad. It may seem and feel like you're at the end of your rope, but it's not that bad. That God is, is still powerful. God is still faithful enough. It's not so bad that you have to throw in the towel. Please believe me and please listen to me tonight. It seems like the, the longer that, that, that I serve God, I mean, I see God's glory and I see his greatness, but... Occasionally, out of the blue, you get bad news, and, and, and you, you hear these things, and you wonder why. Because people feel alone. The enemy has convinced them that there's no one that understands you. There's no one that, that is there to help you, but that's a lie from the pit of hell. Please, if you're in this place and you feel alone, you feel like there's no more answers for you, that's a lie from the enemy. You know what the Bible tells us? That as long as there is breath in your lungs, there is hope for you. As long as there is breath in your lungs, there is still hope. It's not that bad. It's not worth throwing in the towel. It's not worth calling it quits. 
People love you. People are praying for you. People are standing in the gap for you. You may not know this, but they're praying for you and they're blessed when they see you. Whenever I see my brothers and sisters walk through these doors, man, it encourages me. It blesses me, and I may not get to, to, uh, to talk to you every service, but just seeing you here tonight, my brothers and my sisters still fighting the good fight of faith, man. It encourages me, and if it encourages me, I know it encourages the rest of us. Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord says, The Lord himself goes before you. This word is for you tonight, church. Receive this, grasp this. The Lord himself goes before you, and he will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Perhaps you have some huge situations and circumstances that are soon coming your way and you can see it and sometimes the 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 anticipation of what's going to happen can just try to crush us but the lord says two things don't be afraid and don't be discouraged don't be afraid because with god all things are possible god is still able to to move mountains god is still able to bring that miracle god is still able so don't be afraid and God can tell us that because he understands his power. He says, don't forget my power. I can still do it. I can still move. Don't be afraid. And secondly, don't be discouraged. The enemy, that, that's one of his most prized tools and weapons is discouragement. He tries to convince us that there's no hope for our situation, that, that, that we're beyond hope or that we're never going to change. And we get discouraged and, and he gets us in a rut. But that's a lie from the enemy. The Lord tells us, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Why? Because the Lord himself goes before you, and he's with you tonight. God's with you tonight. God is with you tonight in your situation. God is with you tonight in your trial. God is with you in that time of testing. God is right there with you. You are not alone tonight. Pray first. In prayer, we get the favor of God. Psalm chapter 5, verse 12. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as a shield. God's favor is powerful. As you and I strive with God's help and humility to keep a clean heart, running to Jesus, staying in prayer, the favor of God will surround you. What does favor do? Favor will open up doors for you. Fa favor will make a way for you when, when even, perhaps, even when you're not praying about it, God will open up opportunities of blessing for your life. Why? Because it's the favor of God. He'll shield you. He'll cover you. Favor will go before you. Isaiah 58, 11, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Despite the condition of the economy or the condition of your bank account or the condition of, of, of your skills and abilities, God will still be able to move beyond that. God will, allow, uh, will, will water you even in a scorched earth like a spring whose waters never fail. God will provide. And lastly tonight, as our worship team makes their way up, I want to spend a moment here. As we talk about praying first, we have to stand in the gap. And this is called intercession. Standing in the gap for your loved one, for your brother and your sisters. Now, you and I have the answer. It doesn't mean that our life is... is I mean, God's always going to be working on us until the day that we die. So we haven't yet arrived yet, but you and I have the answer. If you have Jesus, you have the answer for your family. You have the answer for your loved ones, for those that are sick, that are fighting ailments and illnesses tonight. You have the answer. It's in you. And who is it? It's Jesus Christ. See, sometimes we can get so busy and we could forget that there's a lost and a dying world around us, and, and, and we... We marinate in the blessings, and we thank God for the blessings, and we, we enjoy the blessings, but we can't forget that there, is, there are others around us that are crying out, that are hurting. You have the answer tonight. You have the truth. You have the words of truth. It's in Jesus Christ. 
See, Nehemiah, as we, as we look back in our text, Nehemiah stood in the gap for God's people. He could have easily said, let the next guy do it. I'm not qualified. Isn't that what Moses tried to do when, when God said, I'm, I'm selecting you to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go? What did Moses do? He tried to convince God that, Lord, I, I'm not eloquent of speech. I'm not, I'm not your man. So why don't you tell Aaron? Why don't you tell someone else? I can't do this. But God says, no, I'm selecting you tonight. You have the answer. I'm calling you. And it's not our own words. It's not our abilities or, our, or it's us. It's not us at all. It's the power that lives inside of us. It's Jesus. It's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ that we have living inside of us that is the answer for this world. Nehemiah stood in the gap. And as we're going to talk about all this month, we're going to see how God used him to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, to rebuild the gates. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, Isaiah writes this. He says, Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom shall I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? I said, here I am. Send me. And that's God's word tonight. There's a loss in a dying world. Well, Lord, I, I just, I need to get things together in my life. I'm so caught up and I'm so busy with getting things together. If we have that attitude, church, we will be saying that until, our, until we get to our grave. By yourself, you're never going to get it all together. God's going to do it. Focus on his will. We read in Matthew 6, seek the kingdom of God first, and God's going to work all that out. I'm not talking about disqualifying yourself and living crazy. I'm not talking about that. We have to strive to live righteously. But have an attitude and a heart to say, yes, Lord, if you want to send someone, Lord, send me. I'll do it. That person needs a visit, they need a phone call, they need a text, they need a conversation, they need a hug. Lord, that's me, I'll do it. Send me, I'll go. Intercession. Nehemiah stood in the gap for God's people for their good. He put his priorities and his desires and his selfish ambitions, he put it to the side and he said that God's people need help, God's city needs help, I'll be the one. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, as I close this down, the Bible says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Prayers and intercessions. Intercession is you and I standing in the gap for that loved one that may not be here present with us tonight, but you've been praying for them. You've been praying that they come into the house of God, that they hear the good news, that they hear the truth. Stand in the gap for them. Your loved one that is fighting that sickness and that you're, you're believing for healing, stand in the gap for them. That one that is down and out and discouraged, stand in the gap for them. That family who has lost a father, stand in the gap for them. That family, those kids who've lost a mother, stand in the gap. Give them Jesus. Let God use your life, and we will win this world for Jesus Christ. They're searching and they're looking, and you and I have the answer. Tonight, with every head bowed and every eye closed tonight, 